Good evening, everyone. Once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Brendan Stephen. I'm the Executive Director of Catholic Conscience, uh, uh, who's hosting tonight's conversation with uh, Dr. Brett Salkeld, the theologian in residence at the Archdiocese of Regina, for a conversation about a topic that seems very relevant on the day an American president is inaugurated, which is voting, voting like a Catholic. Um, and we're very much looking forward to having Brett here. Brett, of course, if you could say hello, Brett, being the other person appearing on screen. Hi, everyone. Good to so, be here. Uh, so before we get started, um, as is, oh, I'm just going to hit that mute button. Um, so before we get started, uh, as always, I'd, I'd love to start with opening prayer. So if you could all join me in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, uh, we turn to St. Joseph, uh, who is patron of Canada, patron of work, patron of families, um, patron of so many of the things that are brought to bear. Uh, by voting and and the importance of voting, um, particularly voting as as an act of love for our neighbors um, and an act of citizenship and something charitable that we give to the world in light of our faith. Oh, sorry, Caroline, I'm going to keep you on mute. We're just hearing some background noise there. If you could stay on mute, Carolina, thank you. Uh, so we turn to St. Joseph um, and ask him for his intercession tonight, that we can have an enlightening conversation, a charitable conversation about a topic that's so important to our faith, of course, which is the way we use politics and our participation in, in politics and in government and in, in civic life as a way of promoting the common good and of promoting justice in the world. So thank you, St. Joseph, for your uh, intercession this evening. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your presence in this conversation. Um, and we'll pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And with that, let's get started. So I would be remiss if I didn't uh, begin by introducing our guest. Um, this is, as I said, Dr. Brett Salkeld. He's Archdiocese, Archdiocesan Theologian for the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Regina, where he's responsible for deacon formation. Brett is the author of Can Catholics and Evangelicals Agree About Purgatory and the Last Judgment? And How Far Can We Go? A Catholic Guide to Sex and Dating with Leah Perot. He is currently working on a book for Catholic teachers tentatively titled Making Every Class Catholic. Brett is a sought after speaker on many topics related to the faith, he also serves the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops as a member of the Roman Catholic Evangelical Dialogue in Canada. His weekly podcast, which I know a little something about, with Deacon Eric Goresh is called Thinking Faith. Brett has a large back catalogue of blog posts at both Vox Nova and Sask, a theologian. He was baptized in St. Wenceslas, Paris in Gerald, uh, Saskatchewan, where he grew up and now lives with his wife Flannery and their six children in Regina. Welcome, oh, that's, a, that's an old bio. We got seven children and I have another book. So anyway. ah, I'm sorry. I pulled it from the wrong website. <laughs> no, that's fine. We should have double checked that. Anyways, yeah, Martha just turned one. So we have seven children now. But, Congratulations. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you. There you go. It's good to so, be here. So uh, the, I guess, Brett, the two reasons we wanted to chat with you about this really important topic. One, of course, um, we had the great pleasure of collaborating with you as part of the Catholic Action uh, Voter Education Campaign in Saskatchewan, um, which was a wonderful initiative, which might come up a little bit tonight. Um, but more importantly, you wrote a, an article for Church Life Journal in the lead up to the um, American election that we just had in 2020. And I love the title of the article, and I'll share the title. It's called Holding Your Nose, Voting Like a Catholic which <laughs> I loved the title because I think it captured very neatly some of the themes that, that, that are covered in uh, are going to be covered in tonight's talk. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And so yeah, I, I want to go ahead, go ahead. Well, I just it, part of the old bio, it, a new bio would mention I've been publishing things on Church Life Journal as well. And this is one of the things I, I've published on Church Life Journal. So uh, yeah, and it was uh, the holding your nose. I had a I had a, a hope that I could start a, a movement of people taking a picture of themselves voting with the hashtag holding your nose, uh, but it didn't take off, but it still could. <laughs> there will be future elections. So well, we're all part of the movement. See why I think that's a good idea as we go forward. <laughs> well, we're all part of the movement now. So there you go. Why just the hashtag? Um, and, and, and so I think uh, the I included the article as part of the um, the RSVP and the Eventbrite link because 
I think it's a great situation. It situates us really nicely in this conversation tonight. And I think it's important to introduce what we're going to talk about tonight is not why a Catholic should vote for one party or another or which issues are more important than other issues. What we really want to talk about tonight is how every Catholic can discern their own conscience during elections um, using a framework, using Catholic social teaching and other tools, prayer, um, to figure out um, what they think is the most appropriate vote in any, in any given election. So this isn't really, we're not going to have a partisan conversation. We're not really going to talk about politics in the sense of particular parties or particular issues. Really what we're going to talk about is discernment. We're going to talk about, you know, how to think about voting as a moral choice and how we can, how we can reflect on that choice. And I think it's important, Brett, to kind of situate that conversation a little bit um, and I want to actually to do, and by, by which I mean to situate it by talking about voting as it's sort of outlined in Catholic social teaching broadly. And I want to quote quickly from your article because you make um, an excellent point that I'd love for you to kind of delve into a little bit. Um, and you say in your article, no political system, party or candidate will bring about the kingdom of God and that Catholics need to be wary of the totalizing claims of politics. And, and here's the kicker. Politics are not sacred. So can you explain a little bit more what you meant by that, by that statement to help situate us a little bit? Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the first steps Catholics need to realize if we want to participate well in the political sphere is that the political sphere will always make totalizing claims. It will try to supplant your religion as your basic worldview. It will it will say this is the most important thing. And it, and in that way, it can become an idol. And I think it's really essential for Catholics to recognize um, politics are are one tool at our disposal for building the kingdom of God. But they are it is not the only tool. And it's very easy to fall into this idea that if I have political power, then I can achieve all this good. And but the next step is then I will justify all kinds of things in order to gain political power. And it starts out as this uh, this idea that, you know, if I have this power, I can do this good. Pretty soon it becomes power for its own sake. And you you do anything to get it and you do anything to hold on to it. Uh, and and you can I mean, at, at the extreme end, you see when when it you know, we can look at totalitarian regimes that kill the opposition and that sort of thing. But it starts with little lies that we tell ourselves uh, that we, we that we think are justified in order to win the next election. And I think, you know, Christianity is, is happy to work with political power when we have it. Uh, but we need to be willing to let go of it and work without it when we don't have it and not sacrifice our integrity to get it. Because if the cross tells you anything or what Jesus says to Pilate, right, if my kingdom were of this world, there would be an army here that you couldn't deal with, right? Um, but instead, what we see is power in weakness, power that doesn't fight worldly power or political power on its own terms. And so if, if we've started to believe that we can advance the kingdom if we don't have political power, then we've actually lost hold on Christianity and we believe in something else that might have some Christian trappings and might share some common goals with Christianity. But watch what will happen. It'll pick a handful of goals that it'll share with Christianity, and it will ask you to sacrifice those other Christian goals. And pretty soon, your Christianity will look remarkably like one party or another, because you've decided to identify your Christianity with the elements that line up with the party and not otherwise. And now, instead of judging your politics with your, with your Christian values, you've judged your Christianity with your political values. And it's, it's so easy for that to happen. And the political the nature of political claims is that they tend in that direction. And so we actually have to be very conscious that that's what's happening and, and not get caught by that. Because it's, it's, it's really easy to just miss it, to, to become committed to a political ideology over my faith and not even realize it happened. And think, because the parties want me to think this, think that I'm actually the better Catholic for it. I'm a better Catholic because of my political commitment. And then I judge my fellow Catholics who don't share my political commitments. And, and 
I'm, I'm doing a whole programmatic thing here and we'll get into details. <laughs> I love it. Keep the, going. <laughs> the, fi the final, oh, shoot. And what was the final thing? Um, no, I lost it, but we'll come back to it. We'll come oh, I'm back. sure we will. I'm sure yeah, we will. I, I interrupted myself and then, and then I lost it. So um, I, I think to kind of, kind of put a, a high level summary on what you're saying, Brent, and, and as, as I'm hearing it, um, I think one of the mistakes we perhaps, some of us perhaps make as Catholics in political involvement is our Catholicism becomes secondary to the political involvement. So whereas the opposite is almost true that, and you use this phrase and we used it in the event poster that um, the important thing is not necessarily the immediate coming election. The short term is not the point, rather it's the longer view of evangelization that is important. And so we have to engage in politics in a way that fits our witness as Christians our, the virtues that we that we seek as Christians, our relationship with God and the kingdom of God. We are, we're Christians who go into politics rather than we exist in politics in a political milieu and sometimes that very worldly dominate, fight, win kind of attitude that's found in politics and then take that fallenness into our faith life, into our church community, right? Does that make sense right. as I describe it? Yeah, and, and the short-term thing is really essential, right? Because like, if your political program as a Christian to, to imbibe your culture with Christian values means that your party needs to hold power indefinitely, you're in trouble because your party's <laughs> going to lose, right? Yeah. And so, so, but then we get this rhetoric that says, well, this election is the most important election in history. If we lose this one, it's all over. And we heard that from both sides in the last American election, right? If Trump or Biden wins, it's over. That's the end of America. Well, then, then you can justify almost anything to make sure your guy wins, including lying to and about your fellow Catholics, lying about the teaching of the church if it's inconvenient for your political end, right? And then I, I, one thing that has crushed my soul, really, is watching Catholics lying and watching them attack each other uh, when... We could have good faith disagreements. I'm not, and we'll get into that. Good faith disagreements are, are good. In fact, done well, they're a spiritual work of mercy because we might have something to learn from each other and we should be instructing the ignorant, which is all of us, right? We, we, should, be, we should be able to disagree well, but the, the lying and the attacks on one another is what a gift to the parties who now do not have to deal with what should be the most influential political bloc in, in either Canada or the United States. In terms of numbers, there, nobody competes with Catholics. And in terms of, um, in terms of like, have we thought about what it takes to build the common good? We, mm -hmm. like, we've done more thinking at a greater depth for a longer time than, uh, than almost anything else you can point to about what builds for the common good. But we neuter ourselves or we let the parties neuter our witness by turning all our energies against each other so that yeah. the parties can go along without being challenged by the gospel at all. And it just, it just killed me to watch us lying on behalf of the parties and distorting church teaching to one another and, and slandering one another and watching the parties do and say whatever they were going to say anyway and watch the Catholic vote get split almost in the same proportion as the general population so that we're basically a wash. We have immense political capital and we've we've been seduced into just wasting it. it so this, this is why I love Catholic conscience because it, it's a sign of hope that we're gonna learn how to stop doing that. And, and I'll say too, I, and, and I think it's actually a really great introduction to why this conversation is so important. You touched a little bit on, you know, our demographic weight as a community. So just as an example of this for the audience, you know, um, when we did the Catholic Action Campaign for the 2019 federal election, we looked at, you know, uh, there was some analysis done around what is the impact of the Catholic vote just in the GTA. This is just in Toronto. And, you know, our Catholic voters were a serious plurality in what amounted to 54 ridings, which in the GTA and in, in, in lots of ridings where, you know, they swing between different parties depending on the election and the issues, it, to your point, is a huge amount of, of overall political influence, right? Um, 
I don't think it's unfair to say Catholics pick governments in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I think and I think it's it's to just get away from the worldly power point. It's why it's so critical that we're well formed as voters, because that that is an enormous responsibility to be thoughtful about the common good and the ways our vote can contribute to the common good and um, to to add an element of virtue and a vision based in Catholic social teaching and our faith to bring that into politics, to evangelize politics by our voting. If we were all well-formed voters, I can tell you right now, we'd have way better politicians. They'd be far less prone to lying to us. The promises they would make to us, they'd feel a lot, they would feel much more of a, of a draw to fulfilling those promises. It, and that all comes down to uh, really the formation of voters. And our community is a huge, huge part of that. So right, right. that's why this conversation tonight is so important because we have to bring, I think, the same kind of moral discernment and moral energy to the act of voting and political participation as we do, I'm being a bit dramatic, but to our families, to the way that we raise our kids, to the way well, we treat our parents. To, we have to bring that same love of neighbor, right? Yeah, and and I let me let me qualify just slightly. I think a lot of times we do bring that level of energy, but it's not well channeled and and we become hacks for the parties instead of witnesses for the gospel. Yeah. You know, a, yeah. a lot of Catholics do 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 the work, but it's basically canceled out by Catholics on the other side. And it, and and we we just repli we replicate the party divisions within the church. Right. Which and, and, to me is just a scandal, you know? And so uh, like when you mentioned evangelization, I'll just give an example that came from the Saskatchewan campaign that we worked on together. We, we crafted a series of questions for representatives from each of the parties. And we had a Catholic journalist from Saskatchewan put these questions to them. And some of the politicians who had to field the question said, where did these questions come from? These are so well thought out. Like, th this is amazing. Where did you guys get this? And we're like, well, Catholic teaching has thought about all these things, like, pretty seriously. Yeah. But, but the journalist said she realized in the process of doing it that asking a good question of a politician was a form of evangelization. Because they all of a sudden realized that there's something well thought out out there that they need to be responsible to. And, and so one thing I want to say to us is how to vote like a Catholic a huge part of how to vote like a Catholic is how to engage candidates who want your vote. If you've decided that there's there's one issue that's your issue and you're going to ask one question about that and, and you're going to dismiss anyone who doesn't answer it right and you're going to give your vote for free to anyone who does, you've more or less muted yourself. Now they don't even, even if the person you vote for gets elected, they don't have to do anything. Um, they've answered the moral question correctly and now they're off the hook. Instead, you should ask both parties. You say, this matters immensely to me. What can you do about it in terms of policy? Give me something concrete that I can hold your feet to the fire on. But if I ask you an abstract question about moral theology that has literally no policy connotation, but you just, you have the right answer. Maybe it is the right answer on a very important question. And I, I pray to God we have politicians who do have the right answer on very important moral questions. But the question of politics is one of policy. You don't get to vote on whether this or that thing is right or wrong. You get to vote on whether this or that party has a policy that might make this or that thing better. Yeah. And that's what politics is. It's not a referendum on moral questions. It's a, it's a matter of policy. And if we don't hold parties uh, to account on policy, um, we let them dismiss us. Yeah. We, we become we become unnecessary. There, we're either a free vote for some parties or we're people not to bother engaging with for other parties. But we've taken I, ourselves out of the calculation. Before we, we, we kind of go more into detail on this issue, I want to tell a quick story because folks who are aware of our programming know I, I used to work in partisan politics on the political side. And um, what you're describing, actually, uh, it, it reminds me of something really interesting. So during elections, um, the most common thing a politician will do is they will go door knocking. So they'll go into a neighborhood, they'll knock on doors to go talk to voters. And a lot of parties, all the parties actually, I can say this from experience, all the parties tell you that when you go to knock on a door, this is the, 
before I share this, this is the this is the pragmatic advice for politicians who want to win. When you go to knock on a door, you don't want to have a conversation. You want to go to the door, you want to ask them who they're voting for, you want them to tell you, and then you want to go to the next door. Because if you do it that way, you can identify 100, 200, how many more people who might be interested in voting for you or not voting for you, versus if you have to sit and have a substantive conversation with every voter at the door, that process is a lot slower. One of the reasons that advice is given is that no one expects um, no one expects that a voter will want to have a conversation with a politician at the door, that all they'll want to say is, yes, I'm a conservative, I'll vote for you, or yes, I'm a liberal and I'll vote for you. And that's all they're going to want to say. And it speaks exactly to your point, Brett. We don't ask more of them. We, we're, we, we give ourselves away almost as a number. We're just a vote right. to them rather than a relationship or, or someone that they have to persuade. We give away our persuasive power. Right. Um, I, I want to move along because I think there are two big things we want to do in this conversation. Um, and, and, and for lack of a better word, I'll call them, um, you know, the negative and the positive. So one is, you know, there's a lot of myths about discerning your vote as a Catholic that aren't. And these myths, I, I think you put them really well, Brett. A lot of these myths are um, the methods that the parties themselves use to convince us to cast aside our witness as Christians. So I want to talk a little bit about some of these myths and, and, and what Catholic social teaching actually has to say about the act of voting. Right. And I want to talk a little bit more about, well, what would a Catholic approach be to thinking about your vote? What are some methods that we can use to actually, so setting aside the misconceptions, what are some actual techniques and things that we can do to engage in a process of discerning our vote? And to, and, and I'll use the right words, to invite the Holy Spirit in, to help us make the judgment about which is the right option in any given election. So I think it's important we start with the myths. And and you you brought it up, you know, the the conflicts that Catholics have among themselves about, you know, who's voting for the right guy and who's writing for the wrong guy. And often those conflicts manifest themselves in some version of the following. If you don't vote for the guy that I like, you're going to hell. Your soul is endangered. Uh, there's only one Catholic option on the ballot. And if you don't choose it, then you are not a Catholic. You are a heretic. The list goes on and on and on. This this argument, I think, manifests itself in a zillion different ways. We certainly saw it in the American election. So I would love the theologian's perspective, Fred. Right. Can you explain to us a little bit um, what doesn't work about that that line of theological argumentation? Right. Yeah, well, first of all, the church, it's simply not what the church teaches. So that's, there's, there's point number one. Um, <laughs> look, if you're going to go to hell over who you voted for, well, it, it won't be over who you voted for. It will be over how you conducted yourself. Did you lie and cheat and steal to get your guy elected? That, that might get you damned, right? <laughs> um, if you went through an appropriate process of discernment and made a prudential judgment that was different than your neighbor, but you did it in good faith, that's what you're called to do. Might your prudential judgment have been wrong? Absolutely, it might have been wrong. Here's the thing. About the, the church says voting is prudential judgment. Why is it prudential judgment? Well, one, one big reason is because it is chalk of things that you can't know adequately. You, you can't know uh, that this guy's, this group is going to get elected and that they will necessarily Im implement this policy and, and that this policy will have exactly the impact that you hope it will have and et cetera, et cetera. There are, there are so many contingencies in, in, in politics and policy and their implementation that you're, you're working with best guess. And and then you're taking best guess on this issue and weighing it against best guess on 25 other issues. And some parties are going to have policies that are better on this issue and worse on that. And you have to weigh them. And what you're not doing, here's the mistake. The mistake is to say, this issue is the most important one. Therefore, no other issues matter. Uh, vote the right way on this issue. And that's, that's game over. The, the problem is, First of all, that ignores that that voting that way imagines that if you vote that way, you solve the problem the day after the election, right? So you, you elect the pro-life government and abortion ends tomorrow. Look, if that was true, by all means do it, right? But, but the parties use this 
And here's the thing. The parties recognize if they want to get you to vote for, let's take, let's name names. If they want to get you to both vote for Biden, they will talk as if he will end the crisis at the Mexican border tomorrow. Right. And if they want you to vote for Trump, they'll talk as if he will end abortion tomorrow. Neither of those things are true. Do, do either of them have a real shot at ending those? And, and in what ways? And factor in 25 other things. And you've, you've got something about which Catholics of goodwill who do the process correctly and in good faith may come to different decisions. And in fact, that's fully expected. A Catholic has to vote with a formed conscience, but in a, in a context with so much contingency, there is no expectation at all that every single properly formed Catholic conscience would come to the same conclusion. That's, that's, that's not an expectation. But people talk as if it is. If you have a properly formed conscience, you will vote the way I, my properly formed conscience does. And if, and here's the, here's the kicker. And if you don't, then I am in a position to judge your relationship with God. Yeah. yeah. And then we, then we become incapable of having any reasonable discussion about politics or policy because now it's about the state of your soul and you've just been judged by someone. And now we, now we go into defensive mode and you watch the discussions on Facebook. People cannot have discussions about policy because they're defending their existence as a Catholic or a person with a relationship with God, because that's the level we take this to when we falsely misunderstand politics as being about pick this one issue. And, and you might ask this question next, it's intrinsic evil or, uh, or go to hell, right? That those are your options. And that's just not how, that's not how politics works. You don't, you don't get to end an intrinsic evil tomorrow by voting for the right guy. And by the way, there's intrinsic evils. According to Catholic teaching, there's lists of intrinsic evils that all parties, you cannot find a party in a Western democracy that does not support an intrinsic evil. So you're voting for one, whether you like it or not, just might be a different one than your neighbor. Yeah, and, and I think this is the, the, really the next question I want to delve into because I think there is some confusion about, and, and this is one of the misconceptions that voting for a party that's not fully aligned with Catholic teaching is an intrinsic evil versus, and, and you know, please and tell me if I'm not using the correct terminology, but voting for a party that doesn't fully align with Catholic teaching is remote cooperation with evil. And, and I'm sure you'll explain this, but yeah, basically yeah. remote cooperation with evil is something that we would be engaged in with almost any option on the ballot, you know, with every party and even up to and including the choice to not vote at all. So in layman's terms, I would love to get uh, hear from you a little bit about that distinction between an intrinsic evil and participating in intrinsic evil and, and this term remote cooperation with evil. Because so I think it's for voting particularly, it's a really important um, distinction. Right. Could you explain yeah, yeah. that a little bit? So in Catholic moral teaching, an intrinsic evil is something that is always and everywhere wrong. They're often grave evils. So abortion is grave and intrinsically evil. It's very serious and it's always wrong. It's never justified. Um, on the other hand, there are intrinsic evils. Uh, there are things that are ne never okay, according to ch Catholic teaching, that are much less serious than abortion, or at the end are often very much mitigated by circumstance, even though abortion can be mitigated by circumstance too. But for example, um, lying is always and everywhere wrong. Masturbation is always and everywhere wrong. Um, War is not an intrinsic evil. War might be justified. Now, nobody in their right mind thinks that because masturbation is an intrinsic evil, that Catholics need to need to put more attention into voting on a, on a politician's position on that than their position on a potential war. Like, no, nobody actually thinks that, right? So we misuse this category of intrinsic evil. What it means is something that's always and everywhere wrong. And there's, there's a list of them, human trafficking, um, abortion, um, uh, racism, uh, genocide. The, if but, you look but, at Evangelium Vitae, there's a list of intrinsic yeah. evil. And, and I don't want to generalize too much, which is why I'll ask this and, and you tell me if I've got the right impression. The, the impression I get from you is that a lot of these intrinsically evil moral choices are um, personal choices in which the consequence is a bit is one to one. Like I do it, and then the evil thing happens. I'm 
I'm kind of generalizing, but is that yeah. one way to kind of describe it? Well, yeah, I mean, it can be something that I do, but it can be something like societal, like like racism right. is an intrinsic evil or or genocide right. or right. So it can it can be personal or or societal. But but so here's the thing about voting. Um, there there are okay. No one is supporting an intrinsic evil as a politician. Not precisely. They they are proposing policies that will lead to or away from intrinsic evil. The question right. is about policy, right? Are they right. proposing this or that? This is this is a false thing to say. People say I'm against this personally, but as a policy matter, that's bogus. But it does highlight that they're they're not saying I'm for or against. They're saying I'm proposing a policy, right? And right. Um, we're against intrinsic evils, and we're against it, policies that lead to intrinsic evils. But when you're voting, there will be policies that lead to intrinsic evils on all sides. And the church is, so some people say, well, you can never vote for an intrinsic evil. Well, no, you can't, you, you can't vote for intrinsic evil because that's not what you're voting for. You're voting for policy. But can you vote for policy that might lead to intrinsic evil? Your only other option is not to vote. You're going yeah. to vote for someone who's going to have some policy that leads to intrinsic evil. And so you have to do that. So yes, you are. You, yes, you are allowed to vote because your option is not voting. And here's what the church says. Voting for someone whose policy will you can foresee reasonably will lead to intrinsic evil is what is called remote material cooperation with evil, which is um, often unavoidable. Uh, like if you buy something at a grocery store where, where someone in the supply chain was you know, poorly treated or if, or if you you buy from a corporation that's going to make a donation to an immoral cause, or like all, all kinds of things like that, right? Um, it's you have a distant connection with evil, but the the point about material is, um, you do not support the evil, so you can never vote uh, in support of a policy that would lead to intrinsic evil because you support that policy. You can only vote for it. In, you can only vote for that politician in spite of that policy, uh, which is what you're going to do one way or the other. You're going to vote for somebody in spite of policy. If you're a Catholic, you're going to, and you don't buy any political platform whole hog as as the salvation of the world. You're going to vote for some politician that has policy that will lead to intrinsic evil in spite of their in spite of that policy. And if you do it, if you do it in spite of not intending it, you are far enough removed from the evil that that voting for it is justified because voting the other way would would make more evil in your judgment it's it's right. really it's really the old folk wisdom of the lesser of two evils with some very precise categories used to make sense of it i i want to um i want to jump in on this point because in, included in your article you um you included a, a quote from Pope Benedict um, back when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, and I think it's really powerfully captures this point, so I want to say it for the audience. Um, uh, at the time, Cardinal Ratzinger wrote, it is not the church's task to set forth specific political solutions, and even less to propose a single solution as the acceptable one to temporal questions that God has left to the free and responsible judgment of each human person. So fundamentally, this remote cooperation with evil, and this is a key takeaway, I think. Um, to some extent, uh, we engage in it every day through the normal sort of circumstances of our life. Um, you know, certain, uh, you know, purchase decisions that we don't quite consider the moral implications of based on the company's activities in some way are remote cooperation with evil. So just as an example of, you know, it happens all the time. So it's it's hard then to apply this intrinsic evil lens on voting because you know, there's not really a scenario where, and I'm going to use a, a silly example to illustrate this. There's not really an example where a politician will say, um, if you elect me, an hour after you elect me, I will murder this man, <laughs> right? Like you're not going to get like like where the intrinsic evil will be so bald faced, right? And And direct in the sense that your action will lead to another action, which like you will know the outcome, right? Um, it's caught a great example of this, which I think you touched on a little bit in your article. Um, a person might justify voting for a particular party if they want that party to nominate certain Supreme Court justices in a, in a United States context, right? Let's use that as an example. 
which is perfectly fine. That's a prudential judgment. You can make that prudential judgment. But because you cannot necessarily predict what the outcome of those justices' court cases will be, right? You won't know if the justice is going to actually um, rule on certain laws or on certain cases in the way that you expected them to when you supported the candidate who appointed them. It becomes remote cooperation with evil, right? You're very well, it's good at that point if it turns yeah. out well, right? But it's remote. Like, you don't know. It's, you're so far away, right? Yeah. Exactly. And again, it means you can, and that could be your prudential judgment. And I, I, I do want to quickly, Brad, actually touch on this because I think when some of us hear the term prudential judgment, we think of it in a secular way. Like the word prudence has a Christian definition and I would say has kind of a, let's call it a secular contemporary definition, where it's almost a kind of amoral pragmatism. So I would love if you could take a moment, and I think this will frame the next part of our conversation really well about, about um, principles of discernment. Can you explain a little bit what Catholic teaching says about prudential judgment? Like what is a prudential judgment and, and how yeah. it applies in this context? I, I will in just a second. I, I do want to mention one last thing, just so I don't lose the thread. If people are wondering why, you know, why is it important this remote cooperation with evil? You know, why, why these fine distinctions? I think the real key is that you recognize your, your vote is a compromise. And we can, we can, if we are talking with our fellow Catholics and we say, my vote is a compromise, I think it's the compromise you should make. Right. But that's a very different argument than my vote is justified and your vote is completely unjustified. Then we can't communicate with each other. And then we just replicate what the parties are telling us to believe. So I, the thing about recognizing that we're all participating in, 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 in cooperating in evil when we vote, e even though it's justified by some higher good, right? We're trying to overcome, right. you know, the lesser of two evils, whatever. Recognizing that our vote is a compromise allows us to be in better, healthier relationships with Catholics who disagree with us, who made a different compromise, right? Yeah. So I think that, that, I just wanted to get that out. But your question about prudence, right? Prudence is, is the art of practical, um, or it's the virtue of practical uh, judgment in the particular case. So there's all kinds of situations where the church doesn't tell us what to do. It says, in your case, you need to form your conscience and make a prudent decision um, because I can't make that call for you. So here's some places where we, where we, this would be obvious to us, right? How many children should you have, Brendan? <laughs> Let me ask my wife first. No. <laughs> yeah, right. well, the thing is, the church can't tell you how many children yeah, you should have. Exactly, the church exactly. can tell you you should be open to children, right? It can give you a general principle that you should be open to children. And it may even have some specific moral teaching about ways of avoiding children that are immoral. But it can't actually say, Brendan, in your circumstance, uh, here we've, we've run the numbers. And, and to be a good Catholic, uh, you need a minimum of four children. And if right, you don't right. do that, you're a bad Catholic. No, they can't. They, you can't do that. You can say, here are the principles. Be open to children. Don't use these means to avoid children. Um, granted that, you and, you and your spouse have to pray and discern and, and pay attention to what's going on in your life, your health, your finances, the needs of your other kids, what, your job, your, whatever, right? All those kinds of things. So prudential judgment is, is um, when I take the principles that the church gives me and its moral teaching, but I have to apply them to a specific concrete um, circumstance. Um, you know, a really simple one when, when is like dating. Like, when should your first kiss be? Yeah. Like, there, there's a good answer to that. And there are, there are, some, there are some bad answers. Right? There are sometimes that, that, that like don't they're a bad idea, but the church can't say you know if you're in your fourth date and things are going pretty well a chaste peck on the forehead is appropriate like come on you know yeah. um, that that might even be true that might be true in this or that case but it the church can't do all the application work for you we need we need to take principles and then apply them and voting is is just one more example of of that kind of prudential judgment. So it sounds like it's fair to say that in this case, the prudential judgment is, you know, 
the church has this broad set of moral teaching, some of which is specific, right? You cannot do X thing. And others of which are, um, are less prescriptive and more here are the, you know, the high level principles that should inspire your decision making. The church can't specifically apply those principles in the case of every single human life. Again, with those exceptions of, you know, certain kinds of contraception, let's use the, 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 the marriage example, right? So, so you can't do, there are certain things you can't do, but then again, there are broad principles that should define your decision making. And taking all of that into account, you apply that through your own um, reflection and prayer and prudential judgment, and then take those principles to the best of your ability. And I, what I love about the principle of prudential judgment as applied by Catholic social teaching, it gives us a lot of agency, which is why I think it's a beautiful balm for, for the misconception that we can only vote in certain ways to be good Catholics. Right. Because it, it does, I think, the Christian thing, which is to leave the moral responsibility upon us to do the legwork of, of taking these principles and applying them in our particular circumstances and making the best choice that we can, knowing that in some way, shape, or form, we're dealing with deeply imperfect options. That's maybe right. another way to describe remote cooperation. These deeply imperfect options that some of which don't comport with Catholic teaching, others of which do. And so we're making that judgment of what issues are, are more important and in what context and how do I judge that and and then applying it. Is that all kind of fair to describe? Yeah, well, and here, so it, it, it highlights another thing. So some people would like the church to tell them who to vote for, right? Give you the Catholic option. Uh, and, there's and this a, is another big misconception, right? Like, yeah. why, and, doesn't, and, why doesn't the church tell me to vote for X, Y, Z party right. or person? Right. And this can come in a couple forms. Uh, why doesn't the church tell me who to vote for? Because I'm genuinely confused and I'd like some guidance. Or I know exactly who to vote for. Why doesn't the church tell everyone else to vote for the person I'm going to vote for? <laughs> exactly. Right? I mean, exactly. It, can, it can come in that form too, right? Yeah. And there, there's, there's a handful of considerations here. One is, with respect to the, the point you were just making about prudential judgment, the church does not want to um, infantilize us. Right. If if all these kinds of moral decisions are made from authorities above us, what are we going to do when we encounter a situation where the authority is not there to tell us what to do or where another where we've stopped being able to think for ourselves and another authority tells us what to do? Then we're left defenseless. Right. So so one there's several reasons and I'll get to a couple more. One reason why the church doesn't tell us who to vote for or doesn't make our prudential decisions for us in general is because it wants to encourage our moral agency and moral maturity. Like you should do the work to figure this out. And might you get it wrong? Yeah, you might. Um, it's not worth the church weighing in to make sure no one makes mistakes on this. Uh, and, and this goes to a second reason. The church is not infallible on, on picking political candidates either. If you or I make a mistake, if we vote for someone and it turns out we, we trusted them and we shouldn't have, and the policies that they, that they promoted that we thought would do something, turns out they, that our, our, our friends and colleagues who, who made the other option told us all along, actually, that policy is not going to work that way. You watch. It's going to come back to bite you. And sure enough, they were right. You and I are going to make mistakes at a prudential level. Um, and... And that's that's okay. I mean, you do your best with what you got. Uh, you make it make your choice in good faith. But if the church does that, if the church backs a party or a candidate, and it flops, right? If the policy doesn't work out the way you're supposed to, or the party or candidate doesn't keep their promise, or or they keep their promise on that issue, but uh, but they they're they're a disaster on 25 other files, right? Any of those things happen. Um, the church does not have a get out of jail free card. You and I can say, I made the best decision with what the information I had, and I recognize it could be wrong. But if I'm a church and I endorse and I get tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people to vote for a government that ends up being a disaster, the credibility of the church is shot. So that, that's, your, that's your second concern. And, and, I'll, and I'll say quickly, Brett, on that point, I mean, any cursory reading of the history in Europe and in North America of, you know, places where the church's worldly power and direct interface with government 
has overstepped that that um, really important line between prophetic voice and worldly power, it's it's disastrous. It's often it's disastrous. Um, it's disastrous. always a disaster for the church. And, I mean, and a great example, not not to turn into history, but a great example of this was you know broadly church cooperation with. Um, uh, the term I I don't know I can't uh, Duplessis this the premier of Quebec right. and how that had a very serious effect on the church's prophetic witness in Quebec for generations right, right. and it, so it's just one local example in Canada of Europe has many examples of of when that boundary is crossed you know the harm that can be caused to the the mission that we are here for converting souls bringing people to Christ right. And this is what we talked about at the beginning, the short-term gain, right? You, you get in bed with politicians or a party to win the next election because it's the most important one. And then you lose Catholicism in that culture for three generations and counting. Yeah. Was yeah. it worth it? Uh, but I want to say the third one. So, so uh, it was um, moral maturity and agency. Um, not not getting into bed and getting you know getting tied getting tied to a thing and then having egg on your face. But the third one is related to that. It's it's prophetic witness. If the church gets identified with a given party, there starts to be some quid pro quo. Hey, you can't you can't criticize us because we'll we'll scratch your back, you scratch our back, and when we do this other policy that's not so in line with what you like, you just keep your mouth shut because we have a good arrangement that works here. Right. And and. And then when the church starts pulling its punches and being unwilling to critique bad policy and bad government because uh, they agree with this party or candidate on another thing that they thought was important enough to back them in an election, then the church's prophetic voice is, is lost, you know, yeah. uh, and, and it can work. We become in both a faction. Parties. We become a faction. We become a we, party. And... We, we become just one more party ourselves, right? Yeah. So think of the Canada Summer Jobs Act where the bishops were able to stand up with a clear voice to criticize the liberal government on, on the, on the Canada summer jobs. If now here's the thing, if we had backed the liberals, we can't do that the same way. Right. But if we had backed the conservatives, we right. can't do that the same way. I don't care who you back. You, you can't speak up when the policy is bad. So should we be involved in politics? Absolutely. We should speak out about bad policy. Right now, Bill C-7 and Bill C-6, we need to say things about. Is there bad policy, right? Um, but if we if we take that to the point of endorsing parties or candidates, we lose that ability, right? So there, there's, there's a misconception that the reason the church keeps its mouth shut about endorsing uh, candidates is to keep its taxpayer, uh, tax-free status bogus. If that's all it was, pay the taxes and endorse the candidate. It would be worth every penny. If it was good for the church and good for society, I don't care about tax-free status. It's bad for the church and bad for yeah. society. And, I, and I say, I'll say quickly, and I actually think this is a really great way to frame this whole conversation. Um, it's something to keep in mind in any sense of the word in which you're describing Catholic political involvement, whether it's who, who you vote for and how you think about your vote, whether you're running for office, whether you're active in a political party, the, always, especially as Catholics, especially as a church, always we have to remember our first principles. We are here to bring people to Christ. We're here to convert souls. We're here to love our neighbor. We're here to have a prophetic witness of God's love in the world. And that's what we're here to do. And our relationship with politics has to start and end there. And that yeah. relationship has to depend on that bedrock it can't switch where the political power, the political influence becomes more important than converting souls, bringing people to Christ, like loving our neighbor, building the common good. And this is why this is so, such an important conversation. This is where you have to begin. And this has to be the point, right? Right. You cannot reorder those because it becomes idolatrous. As soon as you make that reordering, it becomes idolatrous. And your church, your faith, it becomes a faction. It becomes a party amongst many. We lose that that status, in a sense, of of being, you know, the mission of God on earth, right? right. And it's a good way to think about all of this broadly, right? And and I think a couple of points we talked about earlier that that relates to one is how we do discernment as a community. If we keep what you just said in the forefront of our mind, we can. We can discern together uh, 
instead of attacking one another and and spending all our capital against each other, instead of engaging the parties, we can disagree in healthy ways if we keep that at the forefront of our minds. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and disagreement in healthy ways gets us to better policy proposals, better engagement with politicians, better, better. We've dug ourselves a hole we get because we get we set the bar so low for for policy on issues that matter to us. If all you have to be uh, on pro-life in Canada, if all you have to be now is the only party that might let pro like might maybe if they keep their mouth shut might let pro-lifers into caucus. That's the bar. It's gotten that low that that's the pro-life vote in Canada. Yeah. And it's and we like to blame the politicians for that. We set the bar that low. We said all you need to do is be this much marginally better than the other guy. And then we condemned every other Catholic who disagreed with us. We set the bar that low. And so we, we've destroyed our capacity to get good policy by the way we turn on each other. So that's one thing. And the second thing I wanted to mention in, in, in light of keeping those priorities straight is our own examination of conscience. What's yeah. hap what happens to our souls when we engage in politics? Do we find it a place where we serve God and love our neighbor? If so, we're doing it well. Yeah. If we find it a, is a place where we attack our neighbor and we, we find ourselves out of communion, and where we find and ourselves, we commit intrinsic evils. Like, and that's the—I I think that's the other important point. We lie, we cheat, we like all of these things. Like that, we're, we're, we're doing the thing that we despise, right? Right, right. If we if if we lie and slander, and I can't tell you how disappointing, like how much lie and slander I see on social media between Catholics on politics. You're yeah. better off to do nothing. I don't care who wins the election. If the public face of the okay there's two things there's your own soul and now you're the public face of the church behaving yourself this way on twitter and facebook better off to just go go put in every minute you spend on politics put it put it in on your knees in front of the blessed sacrament and leave it to someone else because yeah. because you're not helping yeah um, I, I want to now turn a little bit because we've talked a lot about these myths and misconceptions and have kind of oriented the conversation around what does Catholic social teaching actually have to say about voting and thinking about political decision making. So I want to turn a little bit. Um, I'd love to give pre people really practical tools. You know, we've said, here's some things you can't, you can't say and you can't do. One of those being you actually have a lot more agency than you think you would um, if you thought that there was one, you know, one option is Catholic, the other option is not Catholic. You have a, you've got a lot of work to do now, right? You've got to reflect on the, on your moral choice. So I want to turn to that part of the conversation. Before I turn to that part of the conversation, I note that we're a minute away from 8 p.m. Um, Brett and I had a conversation earlier today, so we're just going to continue um, talking um, and until we run out of things to talk about, which will probably be however long it goes, not too, too much longer. Um, I'm sure uh, there are some folks who need to get going uh, right at 8 p.m. For those th folks, thank you for joining us. Re really appreciate you coming. Um, rest assured, if you do need to leave right at 8, um, we are, as I said, we're recording this tonight. And so um, if you do need to get going, uh, you will have a recording available um, within the next week or so, probably, where you can watch the remainder of the conversation. But for those who can stay, we would love to have you to stay. Um, because as you can see, Brett, uh, <laughs> Brett and I enjoy talking about this. <laughs> both, both of us think by talking, which is dangerous. <laughs> so it's going to go for a little while. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so I, I, like I said, I want to turn a little bit now to the more positive aspect of this. How are we called to discern our votes and, and use prudential, prudential judgment to, to determine who we want to vote for? And I'm saying this out loud, Brett, because I, I want to make sure we go through all four of these. I think there are four aspects of this. First, the discernment piece. Second, the discussion piece. How do we talk about this with our friends and our family, which is a really important element. Third, the participation piece. You know, how do we talk to our politicians? How do we actually engage actively in, in politics during elections and between elections? And last, um, an element that you touched on very quickly in the last few minutes, which is the examination of con conscience, right? Thinking actively right. about the ways our political engagement are affecting our souls and, and how we're right. behaving in that context. So I want to talk about discernment. Um, what would your advice be, Brett, to a Catholic voter who wants to use their prudential judgment? They understand this notion of remote cooperation with evil, but they also understand that part of prudential judgment is, is making a judgment about 
what is the the best option in terms of promoting good relative to the evils of the the remote evils of the other options how do you right. how can people go about reaching that conclusion in, right. in a way that's prayerful and thoughtful yeah i mean so first you need to identify some key issues that matter and there, i, I want to say that there's at least two different kinds of issues that matter that that we should be attentive to one are what are the issues that are actually at stake in this election right so yeah. what what are the policy differences that the that the that the parties are campaigning about in this election. Um, and then the second are um, perennial issues of Catholic concern, um, whether they are really live issues here and now or not, right? Now, it's important to write, like, don't take something that, that this vote will make zero difference on because it's not a live option and make that trump everything else Right. Uh, and and limit your ability to do good on things that are a live option. But if if you have something that really, really matters and it's not a live option, then the question is not only how do I vote, but what can I do to make it a live option in the future? Yeah. Like, right? And so part of that discernment is, okay, maybe I, I can't vote the way I would want to on every single issue because the parties don't map perfectly onto the thing. So I have to do some triage and say, where can I make the most difference for good this time? And that exactly. might mean leaving something pretty important off the table because it doesn't, no matter how you vote, it's not going to make a difference. But that doesn't mean we are then excused from doing anything about something that's really important. Then we have to ask ourselves, what could we do in, in the interim to make it important? So first step is just to recognize there's there's things that you can, that you're, what will your vote make the biggest difference on? That's one yeah. kind of discernment, right? What will your vote make the biggest difference on? And another kind of discernment is what are key platforms, uh, key planks of Catholic teaching, and where? And this is the work Catholic Conscience did. Where do the where do the party policies line up with those planks of Catholic teaching? So that's that's really key, right? Uh, and and that's in. Uh, life and family that's in environment that's in poverty that's it like th there's a whole range of those kinds of things right and and i'll say quickly on this point um catholic social teaching is both enormously helpful in that it frames the principles that help you think about it but it can also be again this agency point it can be a little frustrating because you still have to do a little um a little <laughs> thinking around to the best of your ability figuring out policies that actually promote those principles. So for example, I, like this is just a random example, we're, we're, the preferential option for the poor is an enormous theme, obviously, in Catholic social teaching. Right. But you can take a platform that's largely based around, let's say, you know, tax cuts for lower income people, um, you know, more free market policies, uh, or you could have something that's more government driven, new programs, things of that nature. And you could learn and educate yourself and two Catholics, both caring about the poor, could come to totally different conclusions about which yep. direction, let's call them, of policies makes the most sense in helping that group of people, right? right. So I think it's important to situate that, and, and it's something we do in the Catholic Action Campaign. You have to think about the preferential option for the poor, but that doesn't mean you know vote for a party that will create a government program versus vote for a party that will remove a government program. There's right. some discernment that has to happen in that process, right, of figuring yeah. out, well, from that preferential option thinking, what is the better option, right? In this particular circumstance with this particular policy. So there's an intellectual uh, you know, component to it. And, and here's what, I love that you said that because here's what Catholics need to do. You and I might come to differing uh, conclusions about what policy will best serve the poor. If we look at the, if we look at the data uh, honestly and open-minded uh, to the best of our ability, we may disagree, but, what is, and that's fine if that's what happens, but the danger I want us to avoid is I'm not even going to really look because I'm actually not that interested. What I'm going to do instead is I was going to vote for this party anyways, and so I will make post hoc rationalizations for why their policy on this matter will be better for the poor, even though I've done no thinking and no looking. And, in, oh, and then when you okay. challenge me, I won't actually engage you to see what policy might work best. I will call into question your relationship with God because you're voting for someone else who I think will do some evil. 
we need to be if 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 so this this is where it bleeds into the second step the discussion step we need to be able to have open and clear discussions about which policies work best with the gospel as our lenses and the real good of the poor in the, in the case of this example it might be the unborn or the environment or in some other example but we picked this one um and not through the lenses of the the political ideology that's going to find some post hoc rat like b- both major political ideologies if we want to call them left and right f- say that their thing is better for the poor and that their thing is better for the environment it, you have to discern it. Let's, assess, let's yeah. assess them without their lenses, right? Let's exactly. let's not give them that freebie. Uh, and, and, the, and I'll say quickly too: the problem with their lenses is that we can take a um, let's call it a factual disagreement, and if we allow our politics to become idolatrous, we will allow some of the idolatrous elements of that ideology to infect our moral thinking. By which I mean this. You know, and I'm just picking a random example while we're on the preferential option conversation. You might hear a person say, well, they're not arguing for X or Y policy because they think it would be a better preferential option for the poor from that from a more perspective. Instead, they'll say, well, the poor don't deserve it, right? Or they should work harder. Or you'll get some of that idolatrous thinking that is contrary to Catholic social teaching, where an I where an ideological moral justification is allowed to crowd out the full humanistic vision of, of Catholic social teaching. Right. And yeah, that, great example. We're going back a little bit, but that's part of the danger of, of, of an invasion of that idolatrous ideological thinking coming into one's Christian witness, right? Right. And then you're getting that inversion, right? Of the right. Uh, instead of the mission of the church on earth, you're the mission of the whatever, you name it, the liberal and, party, the and- conservative party, whatever. Yeah. Nothing destroys our credibility and our Christian witness like uh, like dismissing genuine concerns. So, so for example, uh, oh gosh, okay, this is spicy. I'm going to give a spicy example. All right, throw um, it in. <laughs> right. Um, I, I tried to make the case that that um, this was in a private conversation. I'm not going to name names. That um, in Canada. If we can't get clean water to our citizens, that's a national shame. And that it should be, it's a pro-life issue to get clean water to the reserves that don't have clean water. And we should make that a national priority and we should be ashamed if we can't do that, right? Um, and a, a person who, who was uh, pro-life in the sense of anti-abortion just mocked me and said, yeah, well, you're not going to get water to every Indian in the bush. And I just, I, I, I despair. It's the idolatry. It's the idolatry. I, I yeah. thought like, you will not save a single baby by making the pro-life movement look that whole, one, heartless, uh, inconsistent. One of, the, one, of the, one of the things that I think is a defining feature of the difference between a secular ideology and and the full, you know, human vision, the humanistic vision of Catholic teaching. An ideology will always tell you some humans are more human than others. It will always tell you that some people's dignity are more important than other people's dignity. And almost always, without exception, that certain people's dignity is non-existent. Whereas Catholic social teaching will always um, if if you are a person that likes to order the importance of human life, Catholic social teaching will constantly frustrate you, because and and Pope Francis talks about this a lot in in Fratelli Tutti. He quotes Saint Francis, Saint Francis, who said, "We have to love our brother whether they're right next to us or far away." Right? It's it's a big moral calling. We have to love the whole human family, everyone, as children of God, worthy of of respect and dignity, and ideologies will always, in order to justify their particular vision of what a human being should be, or what a society should be, will always tell you that someone isn't human, or, or that someone is not worthy of dignity. And, and to me, it's one of the most dangerous elements of how ideology can undermine Catholic political witness, is that, I, I, is that desire to rank human beings, right? I really like that as a definition. I've never heard that as a definition of ideology, but from a Catholic point of view, I think that's that has great potential. I like it. Yeah. 
I'm, I'll just say that. Back I like that. Put it in the back that's an interesting. I, I haven't heard it, but I like it. Um, I, I, so we've talked a little bit about this discernment piece, and I really want to quickly say, Brett, because I, I don't know how much further we can go into it. Um, I do want to say to the audience and to, what, and to viewers, something I, I think people don't think to do, which is to actually bring their politics into prayer with them. Um, and, and, and some people that, will. Yeah, that was it. the next step. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some people, I think, will do that in terms of, you know, they'll pray for the prime minister or they'll pray for the president or someone important and powerful to make you know, life affirming decisions. But I think when we're in that prudential judgment phase where we're absorbing a lot of information about the platforms and the policies and the issues of an election, and maybe we're really struggling and we're, you know, it can be hard to weigh which is the greater good in this context that I'm pursuing with my vote. You know, we take so much to prayer. You know, we take the, the, the concerns of our children to prayer or our parents or our church community or in our personal life or particular sins that we're struggling with. Bring your vote into prayer, right? Yeah. You know, ask ask God. And and there, are, you know, um, we're a big fan of asking for the intercession of of in the context of voting Saint Joseph because he is patron of Canada. He's a great right. guy to ask in prayer. <laughs> Who should I vote for in a Canadian right. election? Right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but I think the yeah. Point well, I think I think it'll lead a little into the next uh, couple things. Some of my th I mean, so first of all, absolutely you have to pray, and as you know what? Sometimes we only pray if we're not certain. If you're really certain, I would take that right. to prayer. Like that's your safety net, right? If you're like, I'm 100% sure that the Catholic vote is easy in this case. If the Catholic, there's a very good chance in, in any Western democracy, if the Catholic vote looks obvious to you, you've been taken in by ideology because it yeah. should not look obvious. Uh, so, so you should... If it looks like it doesn't need prayer because it's that easy, it probably needs prayer even more. And, and, uh, and it makes it makes for a really quick point, Brett, I think, which is um, research will tell you that a lot of people will tend to vote for the same party over their lifetime. That a lot of folks kind of have one party or another or one part of the political spectrum that they tend to lean towards. Um, I think a really powerful thing to do both in prayer and in, in, in making judgments and in learning, if you know, you let, you, let's say you have a really particular bent towards the conservative party, um, you're probably called a little bit more to overconsider, you know, the liberal party or the new Democrats or the Greens, knowing that you have a little bit of a temperamental bias towards a particular party that you almost want to go overboard learning about the others to really give yourself that fullness of space to to reflect and make a, a prudential judgment so well so i this goes to something I, I i like to say about prayer which is there's lots of good definitions of prayer but one definition of prayer that i find very helpful for thinking about how prayer works and its its value in my life is that prayer is the practice of seeing the situation from god's point of view because the, the danger is that my own bias is overriding. And that can get me in all kinds of trouble in my personal life and work and whatever else. And prayer allows me to step back and say, God, what do you think? By the way, this is one reason why pray for your enemies works so well. Because when you <laughs> see your enemy from God's point of view, you can't hate them in the same way. It, yeah. like, it almost, I've had it happen where it almost evaporates, where your anger just like you can't when you look at them through God's eyes, right? So, um, yeah, the, your own bias, prayer should be a counterbalance to your own bias. That's one thing. Um, and, and so that applies particularly if you're pretty sure, you know, who you should vote for. But now let's consider the person who's really torn. You don't know who to vote for, right? Yeah. And, and God bless you because you I think most Catholics should be torn most of the time. They're, like, there are not good options out there for Catholics. And let's let's make some better options, and we'll talk about that in a second. But if you're torn, um, first of all, uh, you should pray and watch for a sense of peace. You will be making a compromise one way or the other. Pray about the compromise you're making and see what happens internally, and watch for that sense of peace and confirmation from God, um, because God God knows you're making a compromise one way or the other. Even if you're spoiling your ballot. You're making a compromise by letting the worst of the of the other options go uncontested. So even yeah. that, right? Now, you may find peace for your soul in spoiling your ballot. It's possible. It's possible within Catholic moral teaching to spoil your ballot. Um, it's, it's considered pretty rare, unlikely, but possible. Um, 
But then here's another thing. If you're really torn, one of the things, another thing I like to say about prayer is we generally think of prayer as being about changing God's mind, right? We ask God for things. God, would you please do this? God, would you please do that? And uh, I think God's most, you know how people say, oh, God didn't answer my prayer. God answers every single prayer. Take that to the bank. He answers every single prayer gets an answer. It's not usually yes. <laughs> or the yes is a little more complicated. <laughs> right? It might be yes, but that's rare. It might be yeah. no. And that's, that might be more common than yes. Um, it might be like, hold on a second. Uh, yeah. Like have patience. That's a common answer God gives to prayer. But here's one that I that I that I think God God gives a lot is, are you sure? Are you <laughs> sure that that's what you want to ask me? Tell yeah. me you haven't <laughs> prayed for something and had your conscience go. Why are you asking me that? That's your ego. That's your own bias. That's your own prejudice. I'm God. I don't care who wins <laughs> your football game. You know. I mean, maybe he cares in some. In, it's in it's the way like that. It's like a per- it's a perennial case of Catholic evil. guilt. <laughs> it's like I find sometimes you'll pray for um, my own experience. You'll pray for like a virtue. You'll say, "I Lord, I'm I'm suffering in this virtue. Like I need help with this." And then some part of my mind will say, "Why are you praying about yourself? You selfish! <laughs> How dare you!" <laughs> well, right? Okay. I mean, it could be false scruples. You know, that's <laughs> possible too. But but here's how it applies, right? One of the things that God does in prayer, just like people want the church to tell them who to vote for, if if your prayer to God leaves you unsettled because there aren't good options, the answer God might be giving you in prayer is work for better options. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like that, like if you really take it to prayer and let God unsettle your soul, like sometimes God's job is to unsettle you because sure. you're too comfortable. And, and whether that's you started from a position of, of overconfidence or whether you were just genuinely seeking and you weren't sure what was right, God might lead you to a place of, I need you to do something. I need you to run for office. I need you to write a letter. I need you to phone your thing. I, I need you to get to know your MP so you have a relationship. I need you to do something more than vote. Yeah. Because, yeah. because voting is a blunt instrument. It doesn't say everything you want to say. It says some things you want to say, and then it says other things that you don't want to say. Mm-hmm. I I Facebooked my MP today. I Facebooked him today. And uh, and so if I can jump into a participation a little, because that was a question. Yes, because I think, I think we it's good to get into these things that are unsettling, where we take our prudential judgments and we bring them into other people's lives. And so right, let's start right. with participate. Yeah. So here's, here's, here's something that happened. I, I've taken it very, very uh, seriously to talk to politicians when they show up at my house. So in the in the um, federal election, Michael Cram uh, came to my house. He's a member of my own parish, someone I knew a little bit. We talked a lot. He ended up unseating Ralph Goodale. It was one of the yes, big upsets. That's right. It was one of the big upsets of the last uh, election, and the the time and effort I put in. I, I asked Michael very serious questions. He came over to my house one night and he stayed up for two hours talking politics with me and my kids. It was the best civics lesson my kids have ever had. Now I've built a relationship with him. So when stuff happens, I send him a Facebook message and say, Michael, what's going on with this or that issue on the Hill in the provincial election. So Michael's a conservative and he won right. in the provincial election. My uh, riding was very closely contested between the SAS party, which is sort of center right, and the NDP. There was a SAS party incumbent, and we and the NDP candidate came to our house. And uh, we got talking about a policy that the NDP was promoting. And they were promoting um, universal child care. Right, right. So I said, look, I think universal child care is interesting, uh, especially for single parents, low-income people, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I have a concern. My family, uh, we, we, we're a homeschooling family. I'm a single income earner. What happens with universal child care to me? Uh, all the people on my block who have two or three or four children who go to school uh, and have two income families, they all get a, a five-figure subsidy. Right. But no, if their older kids go to school and their younger kids are in daycare. They get, right. they get a subsidy worth tens of thousands of dollars every year, and they already have two incomes. My family has one income, and we get zero from this. Yeah. 
Now, um, if we support NDP, and I'm sure you do, NDP, uh, a woman's right to choose to stay home with her family if that's what she wants to do with her life. Um, what you've just done with your universal child care policy is put immense financial pressure on my family because we're competing in the same housing market as all our neighbors who just got yeah. a massive subsidy, even though they already make way more money than we do. Right, and she right. said, that's a really good point. Why don't we have a conversation about what would be good for you? I didn't say I won't vote for you or I will vote for you because yeah. I like this policy or I don't. I said this policy will be good for some people, but bad for others. And I want to talk to you about that. We, we had an email exchange about that issue, uh, back and, several back and forth. Then wouldn't you know, she gets elected two days after the election before they could call it because the riding was so close. One, the closest riding in the province this uh, young woman who I built a relationship got elected. Whether I voted for her or not, she did not win or right. lose by one. She won by about 200 votes. My vote didn't put her in or not. And I'm not going to even say whether I voted for her or not. What I'm going to say is she's elected and I have a relationship with her. Yes. Yes. And I think, and this is, I think, a key element of the participation point because, Brett, you put it really powerfully. A vote is a very anonymous act. It says broadly to a politician, I support you, but it provides almost no details of that support. There's no distinction between, I am a, let's say you voted liberal, I am a full throated liberal supporter. I love the liberals. Everything you said and did was great. Versus, I had a really hard time and I barely leaned to you. There was one issue that I liked you a little bit more on than the other guy, so I voted for you. In terms of communicating to the politicians and the parties, that specificity, the vote doesn't provide that at all. It just looks like two liberal votes. But importantly, really, really importantly, um, the relationship element of being um, an active participant in the political process, and I think the powerful one that you referenced is building a relationship with your local member of parliament or your MLA or whatever it is, your local candidate, um, allows you to have nuanced conversations with this person that get away from ideological conversations because you were able to bring the particular circumstances of your family, right? Without telling this woman, you know, I'm going to vote for you or I'm not going to vote for you or I hate your party or I don't like it or I love your party. You were able to engage in a discussion where from her perspective, what she saw you as is a constituent who was reasonable and who could be listened to, right? And, and deserved to be treated with respect and with dignity. I, and I think, whose vote was in play. And whose vote was in play. And that's and, I let and her so, know that I'm here to talk. Totally. And and in that sense, I think I will give specific advice. Don't tell your politicians who you're gonna vote for. But make them a good way to do it is to give them the sense, is to give them the sense that that you know you could be convinced either way. And I'll tell you this quickly from experience. During an election, political parties will, like I said, they'll door knock, door knock, they'll phone call, they will reach out to people to try and identify who you're going to vote for. If I, at day one of an election, if I talk to a voter, if I'm in with the party, if I talk to a voter and the voter says to me, for sure, no ambiguity, I'm voting for you, end of discussion, I won't talk to them till election day because I know who they're going to vote for. So I'm going to now go talk to all the people who I don't know who they're going to vote for in hopes of figuring that out and building a list of people that, uh, that uh, I want to support, right? So by, by giving that sense of ambiguity and by engaging in a conversation, first it invites them in, but again, second, it allows you to get beyond these ideological disagreements and to have a specific conversation beyond talking points and headlines and to say, here's my particular circumstances, how can you help me? And, and you and I talked about this a, a little while ago, Brett, and I, I want to emphasize this point. We understand as Christians that we have to love our enemies in particular, and we have to talk to our enemies, and we have to evangelize to our enemies. It's true for politicians, by which I mean, build a relationship doesn't mean you have to vote for the guy. You don't have to vote for the party that you're build, the, or the politician that you're building a relationship with. And in fact, the relationship with the person you're not voting with might actually be more critical in some ways than with the person that you're supporting because you're crossing that bridge. You're having that conversation and a dialogue with someone that, that you might actually disagree with quite radically. Right. Yeah. Well, it, first of all, yeah, it's, it's from a Christian point of view, it's important to be able to talk with people you disagree with. 
here's a really practical political point of view. Let's say I didn't vote for uh, the, the person who won my riding. I built a relationship with them. I had a good conversation with them. I didn't vote for them. They won. I'm pretty glad to have that relationship with them, yeah. even though I didn't vote for them. I'm their constituent whether I voted for them or not. And now I have their ear. I have their email. I have, I, I, they, they have a, a face to the name. They know that I ask serious critical questions, that I'm not a jerk, that I'm not an ideologue. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely you don't need to vote for them. If they have really like if they win, you want in. If, if, who this this young woman, she's young. She's young. She could be premier one day. She yeah. could be in a cabinet post. She the NDP didn't form government, but who knows? In 20 years, she could be the minister for education. I don't know. Totally. totally. Right? And and even if I didn't vote for her, she doesn't know if I voted for her or not. <laughs> And 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 I and this is a good transition, I think, to the discuss part of the framework. So we've talked about discernment, we've talked about participation. I want to talk about discuss. I think we live in a political milieu in which we believe people cannot be convinced of things, that people cannot be persuaded. And and one of the reasons it's important, I think, to talk with friends and family in a charitable way about our own compromises and our own prudential judgments when it comes to voting and our political choices is because, and I want to quote from your article here, I've been sparing about quoting from your article, but I want to say it because I want you to explain a little bit this term for folks. Um, you talk about how um, uh, arguments against prudential judgments with which you disagree, so you've come to a prudential judgment, you're talking to someone that disagrees with you, um, are a good and necessary thing. They are, according to our tradition, spiritual works of mercy. And I would love for you to delve into this a little bit, this idea of charitably <laughs> correcting others, but, and I think this is important, also being willing to be corrected or to learn something or gain a perspective from another that in turn shifts your own prudential judgment is a spiritual work of mercy. So I, I'd love for you to kind of delve into that a little right. bit. Right. Yeah, I mean, so I, I was thinking of two specific things that on the, on the traditional list of the spiritual works of mercy, right? Um, uh, instructing the ignorant. And, right. uh, and what, what's the, oh shoot, I had it on the tip of my, correcting, um, the one about correcting or. Oh gosh, oh, I'm going to have to Google this. Anyways, if you find it, that's fine. But I mean, keep going, keep going. <laughs> here's, here's the basic idea, right? Now, one of the difficulties with the spiritual works of mercy is it presumes that, that you're ignorant and I'm wise and I instruct you. Well, that's true in some cases, but not everyone's going to grant. That, <laughs> oh, yes, it, it, advise me, oh, wise one, I am so ignorant, right? right. I mean, people may not take that so kindly, but, um, but no, there is something about two people of goodwill who share the same Catholic principles, trying to apply them, both taking the knowledge and wisdom that they have into, into honest, good faith discussion with one another, so each of us can instruct the ignorance in the other. We can learn if we are engaged in good faith ways that doesn't presume the outcome. I'm not here uh, to say, you know, if I don't get you to vote for this party, I'm worried that you're going to hell. I'm here to say from the discerning and the study and the prayer I've done so far, here's the compromise that I've come to. I'm so, I'm at the point, in fact, where I think it's the compromise you should come to. And here's yeah. why. Is that the compromise you're coming to? Oh, no? Well, you're an intelligent Catholic of goodwill who studied this seriously, and you've come to a different conclusion than me. That's at least interesting, isn't it? Why don't you take a shot at instructing me? Tell me what compromise you're making and why you think I should make it. And if we have a conversation like that, we're both going to learn something. And here's the real kicker. There's a better chance of us ending up on the same side and one of us convincing the other if we come in with that attitude than if we come in with the typical attitude, which is your soul is at stake because you don't believe in the same politics that I do. How many I would even do you convince with that argument? Yeah. And I actually, I would even go a step further. In part, you will have those conversations where... I believe one thing, or I've come to one compromise or judgment, you've come to a different, and you know, one convinces the other. I actually think almost the more powerful outcome, because we're fallen human beings. We have our biases, we have our sinfulness, we hear some information, we ignore other information based on our instincts, 
we, we only can learn so much, right? Um, I actually think the, one of the most beautiful outcomes is when two people of good faith made their own prudential judgments, speak to each other charitably. Often what emerges out of those conversations is a larger appreciation of the truth. You've actually come, you've both come to a different outcome by synthesizing your knowledge and synthesizing your discernment and something new has come out of it. In, it's often the way we talk about marriage, right? That something new and unique emerges out of the merging of two people. It's a weird way to describe political conversation as a marriage, but it, it, you do in many cases, I mean, and, and hopefully many of us have experienced this where we've been in a conversation with someone we respect and we love. They say something that, that doesn't comport with what we believe, but we learn something, we grow, we respond in a charitable way, and something new emerges out of that process. And I think in many cases that gets us closer to the truth at the end of the day. So, so I think that there's a spiritual principle at play here, which is virtue is creative, right? If yes. we were engaging yes. honestly and patiently, right, it, it, with courage to say what we think yeah. was true, but but in a way that is prudent and, and generous and whatever else, if we are virtuous in our engagement, the potential for creative uh, responses emerges. If we are vicious, if we are calculating and lying and we don't listen and all the things that we all hate about cont contemporary political discussion, the scope for, for creative solutions narrows and narrows and narrows because the only solution is the one that I already have and yes. I will defend it to the last back into the corner whether it's good or not because I have nothing to learn I just have to win yeah. and so so I think those kind of discussions can lead to creative engagement and this is so this is and I know we got to wrap here because uh we're, we've gone on too long but <laughs> I'm so I'm so convinced that Catholics need to think about how do we get better options next time. And one of those things is the way we engage with our candidates and parties the way and we talked about some examples. But if we have healthy good faith discussions among ourselves, the Holy Spirit will be let into those uh and and there will be creative possibilities uh That's that nice. happen from people who've made different prudential judgments instead of a closing off. And right now what we're seeing in politics in the West in general is just a lack of fresh options. We're recycling yeah. the same arguments. We're trying the same thing over and over and expecting it to work when it has. We need something new, but the gridlock is, is actually a symptom of a spiritual problem. And if we can put in the effort to do the spiritual work of healthy, good faith discussions, the possibility of cre creativity emerges. And dear God, I, I'm not blaspheming. I'm, dear God, do we need that? Yeah, 100%. And, and on that topic of a spiritual work, and, and I do want to wrap up soon, but there is one more concept I want to quickly talk about because I actually think it's, it, there's a reason it's in that, that foursome. It's, I think it's really critical. You know, we, we talked about discerning your vote, praying about it, learning about the parties, their policies, considering options you wouldn't usually consider. Um, we talked about discussing, right, the spiritual work of mercy, not just of correcting our brother or sister, but but letting them correct us and in, in, in seeking the truth together, you know, in, in a charitable way. We talked about participation, talking to candidates, building relationships, talking to the political parties, perhaps not letting them know who we're voting for and, and keeping that relationship going. I, the last one I think is is incredibly critical and and it won't shock anyone, but we never really talk about it in the context of our political involvement. Um, and, and I actually, uh, I, I once again want to um, turn a little bit to, uh, to your article. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we can examine our conscience in the context of voting. And in your article near the end, you say, we should ask ourselves with all the honesty we can muster before God in prayer, what our engagement in the political process has done for our souls. Has it made us more honest, more generous, more patient, more charitable? more self-controlled, more holy, because what God really want, uses to change the world is not votes, but saints. Um, of all the things you said in your article, and again, there's a reason we made a webinar out of it. It was just a really insightful article. I actually think that last point is really powerful. We're, we're not called to be, um, weird way to put it, we're not called to be voters for the sake of co voting, 
voting is just one more way that we seek out sainthood and, and political participation is one more way that we're on the journey to sainthood. And I think I want to talk about this for a second, get your thoughts on this, because um, you did talk about this a little bit. Politics and the nature of, I think, what a lot of secular politics is not is like nowadays can be very corrosive for the soul. Um, aggression, hostility, violence, lying, a lot of sinfulness and evil, um, particularly for some folks who participate in it in a more active way than most of us do. And so I, I, I'd love for you to kind of talk about this a little bit is how do we keep track of the state of our souls? You know, we've, we've done that work. We've thought about our vote. We've talked to our politicians. We've talked to our friends. How do, we, how do we keep track of that and examine that and think about that as we age? Yeah. It's, and why is it important? I think it's worth saying. Why is it important? Right. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, the last line, what God uses to save the world is not votes, but saints is that that's revisiting the question of idolatry, right? Yeah. If you think your vote or, or the vote of your neighbor that you need to coerce, you know, come hell or high water to, to vote correctly. If you think that's what God is using to save the world, then you've bought into politics as idolatry. And yeah. here's, here's what idols do. Idols demand sacrifices. And so one way of thinking about this is, um, has politics asked me to sacrifice my integrity? Has it asked me to sacrifice my interior peace? Has it, right? It, it, and those are the kinds of questions. So can I be attentive to my soul? If I'm engaging in, in the political, what do I notice as fruits in my life? Um, because honestly, it's not worth it. It's it's not worth your soul. It's not worth your 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 family life because you're so distracted and you can't engage with your children. So it's you're not if if you are becoming a worse person, if you're becoming a dishonest person, yeah. uh, or or an angry person or uh, whatever it is. Uh, now there's righteous anger and. Anger is a delicate thing, and maybe I'll say a word about that in a second. There's no righteous lying. There is right. There is righteous anger, um, and I'll I'll say a word. But if you are becoming an angry person, a, a dishonest person, um, you got to step back. It's not worth it. You're not. God is not going to save the world through your vote or getting your neighbor to vote the right way. You're actually setting the the cause of the kingdom back. You're compromising your Christian witness. You're compromising your own sanctity. You're, you're compromising the credibility of the church. Um, it's not worth it. If, if, yeah. if you don't have the spiritual resources to do the political thing uh, well, um, go for a walk. Pray a <laughs> That's a good pandemic advice overall. Just, just make, no matter what, go for a walk. Like, <laughs> like, do, I'm serious. Do something that is better for your soul. Um, but just a word about righteous anger. Um, because I'm worked up here, you know. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I've learned to let myself go because I, I, when I was teaching diaconate, every once in a while I'd get worked up, and when I was done, they would say, "You need to get worked up more often." So, so okay, I'll, I'll <laughs> let me righteous go. anger. Keep it in righteous anger. <laughs> but but here's the thing about righteous anger: um, anger is a response that God put into us. Anger is an appropriate response to injustice. Yes, anger yeah. is an energizing. Uh, motivation to fix something that is wrong in the world. So there's mm -hmm. something about anger that is that, and at its heart, it's a good thing. In, in fallen humanity, it is extremely difficult to get angry for the right reason and to the right degree, and to yeah. act appropriately in response to that. So if you feel angry. That that might be good. Uh, there are things if they don't make you angry, you better check yourself, right? If 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 child trafficking doesn't get your blood boiling, you got a problem, right? The so, first time the first time I read for Telly Tutti, like he uh, Pope Francis spends the first four quarter something to that effect, just talking about all the things that undermine a sense of fraternity in the world, and I was pissed off <laughs> <laughs> reading the whole thing. <laughs> so. That's the first tip is like, if I'm angry, then, then what God is calling me to is to work against some injustice. Mm -hmm. And that's good. But watch out. What, is, what, is, uh, what does God say to Cain? 
you know, like anger, it's, it's waiting to master you. Like it's coming around the corner to get you, right? Like <laughs> it is so easy to do anger wrong, to, to be, to be r- angry about the wrong thing, to a- be angry about something that offends my ego instead of injustice, you know, to some, to some weak person or weak group or whatever, right? It's, it's so easy to be angry because of my own ego. It's so e- easy to be too angry. And it's so easy to not channel my anger into appropriate activity, but to use it inappropriately. So that, that's what I would say about, about righteous anger is when you feel anger, ask yourself, is, is, this, is this against real injustice? And if so, what is the appropriate level of anger? And what is the appropriate options for exercising that anger in a good way? And like running for office might actually be the answer to that question. It might be, right? Yeah. Or the answer might be my ego is completely overwhelmed here and I need to bake cookies. There's prudential judgment, right? right? <laughs> bake the cookies. You must make cookies or you must run for office. No, the church says, here are the basic principles in your circumstance. You discern, should I bake cookies or run for office? And on that, we need people you. who will do both. <laughs> and on the uplifting note of baking cookies, I think we should wrap it up there. I'm very um, happy to end with that. That's, that's <laughs> me too. Me too. Um, a huge thank you, Brett. Um, when we were planning this webinar, uh, obviously we're we're so excited to have our audience here tonight. But we, for future Catholic action campaigns, which for those who don't know is um, an initiative of Catholic Conscience, where we work with dioceses and churches to provide voter education and get out the vote resources during elections. Um, an important thing we do is to is to give voters resources to think about discernment. And the recording we've done tonight in this conversation is a huge part of that. So um, we really appreciate you sitting down with us and and talking about these issues. Um, And a huge thank you to our audience um, for joining us. Uh, We really hope this was an interesting and enlightening and thoughtful conversation. Um, I've been seeing in the background, Matt has um, been sharing our info at catholicconscience.org email. If you have any questions, if you want to learn more about Catholic Conscience, get involved with us. Always happy to have a conversation and answer questions, so please send us a note. I'm also going to drop something in the chat, um, and this is the um, subscription page for our newsletter. Now, the reason I'm sharing this is um, if you uh, found this conversation compelling and you want to think more deeply and prayerfully and thoughtfully about your vote in future, we aim to do a Catholic action campaign and provide resources for Catholic voters in every single Canadian election. So if you sign up for that newsletter, um, you will have, when, whenever those elections come up, you'll have access to all the resources we put together. Um, amongst other things, I'll just give one example. We provide a party platform comparison in elections where we'll take the key pillars of Catholic social teaching, give you a little bit of education about what those, what's contained in those principles, and give you some of the key policies from each of the parties related to those principles. Never telling you who to vote for. Again, we've talked about this tonight. This is all a matter of prudential judgment. But putting it all on one page for you to give you a resource to help you think about that vote in the context of, of, our, of Catholic teaching and, and of our faith. So uh, that's that. That's my shameless plug. Um, with that, and, and thanks to Brett, I will have Matt join us um, and flip on his... Uh, his video and, and his microphone, just to give a, a closing reflection and, and uh, to lead us in a closing prayer. Uh, Matt Marquardt is the president and founder of Catholic Conscience. So welcome, Matt, and uh, why don't you speak to our audience? <clears throat> Brilliant conversation, gentlemen. That was uh, uh, just amazing. Um, so yeah, uh, just a, a very quick thought. that I, I think I just want to kind of synthesize for a minute because um, some very, very deep stuff here. Um, in my sense, following the comments and just knowing uh, the kinds of people that we often deal with is that um, sometimes people really are lost and some great clues here today, but just just to reinforce it briefly, um, here's the, a process that we believe a Catholic conscience a Catholic should use in voting. One is that we have a duty to participate. Every Catholic, according to the Catechism and the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church, has a duty to participate in civil life in accordance with their place in life. You know, so that is kind of going to what uh, Brett was saying just a few minutes ago, that it kind of depends on who you are and where you are, you know, whether you can bake cookies or whether you can get angry and do something. So, but we all have a duty to uh, participate um, at the level that we can. 
So for at a minimum, that means that we need to vote. And voting means that we need to uh, pay attention to the news, inform ourselves, talk to people, talk to our representatives, talk to our neighbors, and familiarize ourselves with what the church actually teaches. You know, we often hear little slices of it here and there. We don't often get the big picture, but we have a duty to um, educate ourselves about all these things. And that's a large part of what Catholic conscience is trying to do. Then a really important part that we talked on tonight is we have to pray because none of the parties is perfect. We don't know, like uh, the gentleman said, we don't know what any party or any individual is actually going to end up doing compared to what they said they were going to do. So we have to pray. And then we have to vote with confidence. But beyond that, between elections, we have to stay involved. We have to stay involved with our representatives, with our neighbors. We have to talk, um, as they suggested, you know, some of us can be called to deeper involvement. We want to look at getting involved in politics, getting, you know, either helping a candidate run or becoming a candidate ourselves. Very important. And we can write to our, um, our representatives. Uh, Brett mentioned bills C6 and C7. Stand by. I think we're going to um, send some information out from Catholic Conscience very soon. Uh, with some ideas about what to write and who to write to. It's very important things. But then also, when we let go and finally, you know, we finished our praying, finished our education, and we're ready to vote and we're ready to let go, we have to do that with confidence. I think Brett particularly um, suggested that. Remembering that it's not all up to us. We're only a small part of God's plan. We are a critical part of God's plan, but we're only a small critical part. There's a lot of critical parts. So we need to uh, let go, pray, with confidence and bear in mind with some comfort that Christ is the great multiplier. Twice, Christ took loaves and fishes and multiplied them to feed the multitudes. Uh, if he can do that with a couple of loaves and a couple of fish, imagine what he can do with a few votes. Um, so always the confidence. So maybe very quickly we'll pray to the good shepherd and his mother. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the good shepherd standing at the gate. We pray that you will call each of us by name as you promised you would. People will hear your call. We will respond to it. We will move towards the gate, but always bringing those around with us, around us, with us gently, not pushing them, not shoving them aside to get there first, but always bringing them gently together so we arrive together. And we pray to your mother that she will help us and intercede for us. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, that was amazing. Father, Wonderful. Jesus. Thank you, man. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining us. And uh, thanks for Brett for joining us. And uh, we hope you enjoyed. And, and follow us on Facebook. Follow our newsletter. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks again. Good night. Good night, everyone.